Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's SETI Institute seminar. This week we have Dr. Elizabeth Bell. Bethann studied geology at the University of South Carolina, then moved to UCLA for her PhD in geochemistry. She's now still at UCLA as Simon's Foundation postdoc, studying the origin of life. Bethann's done a lot of projects, particularly focused on zircons, some of the la oldest remaining bits of rock on the Earth. And she'll be talking about one of her most recent projects, which suggests interesting things about the history of life on Earth. All right, uh, well, thanks for inviting me out here today, and I'm really excited to share with you some recent results we've gotten looking at carbonaceous materials uh, in Hidean zircons and indeed uh, pushing back the earliest evidence for life on Earth. Uh, so what I would like to do right now is I'm going to start off with a brief history of what we know about the very early history of our planet and of our solar system. And so we know that the oldest solids in our solar system formed around 4.57 billion years ago, and uh, the Earth formed shortly thereafter. And however, the oldest rock that we have yet found on Earth today is only around 4 billion years old. These are the Acosta Nices in Canada. So we have this around 500 million year period for which we don't really have a rock record on Earth. Uh, we call this the Hadean Eon. So when I say Hadean, I mean older than the rock record, older than 4 billion years. And so this is a sort of a mysterious eon in which we don't have uh, all that much information that we can uh, glean from having a rock record. Uh, we do have some sparse samples from this region. Uh, these are uh, detrital zircons from the Jack Hills locality in Western Australia that I'm going to be talking about uh, for the rest of this talk. Um, now, uh, following the, uh, the Hadean period until about 2.5 billion years ago is what we call the Archean Eon. And we do have a geologic record, though it's quite sparse. It gets sparser with uh, increasing age in the Archean. Uh, but we do know some of the uh, um, conditions on the Earth during this period. We know that there were oceans. And we know that there was uh, mountain building events of some type, although the tectonic style is uncertain. Uh, and indeed, throughout the Archean and the Hadean, the existence of plate tectonics or potentially other uh, uh, alternative tectonic regimes is still a source of controversy. And one other thing that we're not entirely certain about is when life began. So we do have some ideas about the early history of life. And uh, in particular, I'm showing you here, we have the oldest uh, uh, fossils uh, have yet been found are a little less than 3.5 billion years old. Uh, these are microfossils in the, uh, the Pilbara Craton in uh, Australia. Um, and the oldest isotopic evidence for life, these are carbon isotope ratios that uh, are also going to form uh, much of the basis of my talk, is just a little older at 3.8 billion years ago. Now, if you think about this number, 3.8 billion years, whereas the oldest rock that we have yet found is 4 billion years old, is this a coincidence that we're finding the earliest evidence for life so soon after the rock record begins, or is this more of a preservation effect? Um, in fact, do we have the origin of life occurring somewhere much further back uh, into the deep Hadean, and we simply don't have the rock record to tell? Now, I mentioned that we do have uh, some record of the Hadean, and what I'm showing you here is the Jack Hills locality in Western Australia. What you're looking at is a three billion year old sandstone. So it was deposited three billion years ago. And when I'm talking about detrital zircons, so that uh, this is an example. These are uh, actually zircons from this rock, from the Jack Hills. So zircon is a mineral that is very useful for many geochemical purposes. And uh, detrital just means that it has been uh, eroded out of its original rock. It's taken out of its original context. And we now find it in this sedimentary rock. So each of these uh, grains, they are imagine about 100 or 200 microns long. 100 microns is about the width of a human hair uh, for, uh, for scale there. And so this uh, 3 billion year old sandstone hosts zircons that uh, range between 3 billion years and nearly 4.4 billion years in age. And somewhere between 3 and 5% of the zircons in this rock are older than 4 billion years. And they are our best known window into this Hadean period. And so the zircons, uh, since they've been really uh, thoroughly investigated geochemically over the past decade or so, have really changed our view of the Earth's first few hundred million years. 
So if we, we're going to think now about the classic view of the Hadean, the uh, very early period of Earth's history. This is uh, uh, something that you can find often in textbooks today. It's also sort of been propagated into popular culture in many ways. If you think about uh, the Fantasia movie and sort of the origin of Earth's sequence. So the classic view of the Hadean is that there was uh, no water available on the surface. You have a persistent magma ocean hanging around for a very long time, uh, surface disrupted uh, very strongly by bolides, uh, that is, uh, meteorite impacts. Um, in some, very inhospitable and not the sort of environment in which you would expect to find life. So the Jack Hill Zircons have given us a, a, a very new view of the Hadean, and I'm going to go briefly over many of the lines of evidence that have been used to uh, tell us that the Hadean may have looked a lot more like the modern Earth than we had originally thought. So first, I am going to go over what we, uh, what we know about zircon and why zircon is really a, an ideal mineral for many of these investigations. So I'm showing you here uh, a periodic table that is color-coded based on something we call compatibility. So if, uh, uh, when a geochemist talks about compatibility, uh, we're saying we have uh, zircon, it's growing in a magma, and if, a, uh, if a, an element is very compatible in the zircon, then as the zircon grows, it's going to tend to be found in the zircon rather than in the magma. Um, so we've got a low compatibility to high compatibility with a high compatibility, uh, notably uranium, with a lead having low compatibility. So what this does is this leads to very high uranium lead ratios as zircon grows. And uh, this is very helpful for geochronology. So uranium decays to lead, um, uh, two long-lived isotopes of uranium, uh, these decay at, a, at known rates. And so zircon is really the premier geochronometer in a lot of geologic systems because it is uh, very widespread in many igneous rocks uh, and metamorphic rocks uh, on the Earth. And it is also very chemically and physically tough. So there aren't really planes of weakness through the zircon structure. It is very di uh, difficult to break it up. Uh, once it gets eroded out of its uh, uh, parent rock, you can also often find it hanging around in the sedimentary environment for billions of years. Uh, witness the fact that we still have four billion year old plus zircons on the planet. Now some other uh, useful things about zircon. Um, so I'm pointing out here titanium, which is uh, one of the elements which is not very compatible in zircon, but it tends to, uh, uh, the extent to which we find titanium in zircon is very sensitive to temperature. So the concentration of titanium ends up being a very good uh, thermometer for zircon, and we can get the crystallization temperature of that particular grain. Um, another thing that's useful, so we have the, uh, the structural components of zircon. Here we have uh, zirconium, silicon, and oxygen. Uh, because oxygen is so um, abundant in zircon, we can, use, we can look at oxygen isotope ratios in zircon uh, at uh, very high precision. And this can tell us something about the materials that went into forming this uh, magma that grew this zircon. Another thing that you'll notice is that carbon is not, also not very compatible in zircon. We don't find it at uh, very uh, high levels in zircon. So uh, when I'm talking about looking for carbonaceous materials in the Hadean, what do I mean? And to answer that, I'm going to put up this uh, image. So this is a cathodoluminescence image of a Jack Hill zircon. This particular one is around 3.42 billion years old, so it's one of the younger ones. Um, but uh, so what you're seeing here, this is uh, this hole here. This is a laser pit from a previous study. Um, and this is a cathodoluminescence image, which means that we have bombarded this zircon with electrons, and it is giving off visible light. And one thing that you can often find in magmatic zircons is this nice sort of growth zoning. So we've got, um, so this is called oscillatory zoning, um, and it's a, it's a bit disrupted up in this region. Uh, but this is often characteristic of magmatic zircons. And uh, one other thing that you can see very nicely in this cathodoluminescence image is that we've got something over here that is not zircon. So this uh, is what we would call an inclusion of, uh, in this case, quartz and muscovite. So in this case, we had a, um, uh, a crystal of, the, of this uh, quartz with some muscovite in it that the zircon grew around as it was growing in the magma. And so what we propose to do is we are going to go through the Jack Hill zircons and see if we can find inclusions that are in fact of carbonaceous minerals. Now we're going to go over some of the uh, other evidence from the Jack Hill zircons that has really given us this very new view of the Hadean. So I'm going to uh, talk first about oxygen isotopes and what they can tell us about water on the early Earth. So I'm showing you this uh, um, uh, quantity here, which is delta-18O. 
and this represents the ratio of oxygen 18 to oxygen 16. So oxygen 16 is the most abundant isotope of oxygen, um, and the oxygen 18 to oxygen 16 ratio in Earth, if you look at materials uh, erupted out of the Earth's mantle, uh, say at a mid-ocean ridge or at Hawaii or Iceland, uh, they fall into a relatively narrow range of uh, values at around five, uh, this is a parts per thousand or per mil scale here of uh, delta 18O. And uh, uh, unless they had been contaminated by materials from the surface. Now the reason materials from the surface can contaminate these uh, uh, mantle lavas is that when you alter or, or when you weather rocks um, in a relatively low temperature aqueous environment, like near the surface, you form clays. And clays tend to be very rich in uh, oxygen 18 relative to oxygen 16. And so when you find, you start finding these high delta 18O signatures, such as, so these are compilations of uh, Hadean Jack Hill zircons. You can see we're stretching away from five up until up to uh, seven or eight per mil. Um, this, uh, when we see it in the uh, modern day earth, is indicative of sediments. And so if you were to go out on the modern day earth and you find a, a, um, a magma that was melted from sediments, you're gonna find these high delta 18O. And so around 2001, when people started looking at oxygen isotopes in the Jack Hill zircons, they find these uh, high delta 18O signatures in a substantial minority of the zircons, suggesting that there was a, a bit of sedimentary involvement in their formation. Uh, moreover, these low temperature aqueous reactions suggesting a hydrosphere as early as 4.35 billion years. Now there are other pieces of evidence that uh, there could have been uh, water involved in the formation of these zircons. And what I'm gonna show you now, this is that uh, titanium and zircon thermometer that I mentioned before. So we've got uh, this uh, titanium and zircon thermometer. This is in degrees Celsius. Um, again, probability density functions. Uh, in blue here, we have our Hadean zircons from Jack Hills, and they cluster very tightly around an average value of around 680 degrees Celsius. So, um, when you're looking at magmas on Earth, this is a very, very low um, uh, number. This is not something that you find in a very wide variety of environments. This really requires um, uh, hydrous and granitic magmas. And uh, so uh, what's uh, special about granitic magmas is if you are to, uh, if you're going to partially melt the Earth's mantle, as you do at mid-ocean ridges, as you do at ocean islands like Hawaii, as you do at Iceland, you are, the majority of material that you get out of there is going to be something called basalt. Um, it is, a, it is um, 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 takes uh, extra uh, evolution steps or evolutionary steps um, in um, um, magmatic processes to get something like a granite. You have to either remelt the basalt or remelt a, another crustal material like sediments. And uh, so the fact that we have, and um, to actually have this uh, relatively low temperature, you need hydrous granite magmas. Uh, so this is another piece of evidence that we have uh, water involved in the formation of these zircons. And moreover, that we might have some more evolved, um, almost continental-like crust early on. Now I've shown another couple of uh, distributions here for comparison. So we have uh, Iceland. So these are zircons from uh, more evolved lithologies from Iceland. So um, you, you have basalts in Iceland and then a very sort of uh, late stage remelting of the basalts. Um, you can get a uh, zircon bearing uh, rocks. Uh, however, they do still tend to be at relatively high temperatures. You see this is a broader distribution, relatively high temperatures. And I'm also showing you in the black curves here, um, uh, zircons that are grown in impact melt sheets. So a large meteorite impact comes in, melts the rocks that it hits, and uh, zircons grown in that uh, uh, sheet are going to have uh, relatively high temperatures, especially compared to these uh, Jack Hills Hadean zircons. So it looks like either uh, uh, a basaltic sort of terrain like Iceland or uh, impact melt sheet origin is really not going to dominate the Jack Hills zircons. Uh, now, mineral inclusions, we've talked about a little bit, but these are also play a very important role in looking at the origin of the Jack Hill zircons. So, uh, for instance, here's this uh, nice uh, quartz and muscovite inclusion that I showed you before. So, uh, the inclusions in the Jack Hill zircons have been looked at since uh, the early 90s, and uh, very consistently, the studies find uh, very granitic looking minerals. So if you're looking at a granite, um, one of the chemical differences from granite to basalt, so the more primitive basalt is going to have, uh, it's going to be much more rich in iron and magnesium. Uh, granite is going to be proportionally much more rich in silicon and aluminum. 
um, and uh, uh, various uh, alkalis are also important. So we have things like quartz, which is silicon dioxide. Um, it's a very common mineral you can find. Um, feldspars and micas are things that we see dominating the assemblage in these uh, zircon inclusions. And they're also characteristic of granites um, on Earth throughout you know, the period in which we can see granites in the geologic record. Um, and in, in fact, uh, at UCLA, we've done quite a lot looking for inclusions in the Hadean zircons. In fact, uh, Michelle Hopkins, uh, who's a former graduate student at UCLA, looked through 1,500 of these zircons older than 4 billion years. Uh, and she found it, that, in fact, the inclusion assemblage is dominated by the minerals quartz and muscovite. So what is muscovite? Uh, muscovite is a mica, and it is important for several reasons. One, um, it is characteristically found in highly aluminous magmas. So the way you get a highly aluminous magma, the uh, easiest way to do that is to melt sediments. So this is another line of evidence for this uh, melting of sediments and this uh, sedimentary origin for a lot of these zircons. Um, another thing that's very useful about muscovite is that the silicon to aluminum ratio of muscovite can be used as a barometer. That is, it can uh, tell you something about the pressure at which that um, muscovite uh, crystallized. And then if you also have the temperature at which the zircon hosting it crystallized from that titanium and zircon thermometer, you can start talking about the pressure and temperature conditions, pressure being uh, relative to depth in the Earth at which these uh, samples formed, and then you can start um, making inferences about tectonic environments. Um, and so one of, the, um, one of the conclusions that Michelle came to is that a possible environment for many of the Jack Hill zircons might be a sort of um, a plate boundary, uh, under-thrusting environment, uh, similar to modern-day subduction zones, although it's uh, un, uh, not clear uh, uh, exactly how uh, this would have manifested in the Hadean Earth. Um, but uh, I, I would be very happy to answer more questions about this uh, um, later. But what you can see overall is that we have uh, a very new view of the Hadean coming out of these zircons from looking at the evidence. Now that we have this uh, geologic record for the Hadean, um, uh, there's uh, several lines of evidence that there was liquid water involved in their formation. Um, there's evidence for early evolved um, granitic looking uh, crust. It's hard to say how much it was if there were like full continents or not. Um, but there, uh, these do appear to derive from a granitic type evolved crust. Um, there's the potential for plate boundary interactions during the Hadean. Um, and so we start to look at a um, early Earth that was a bit more like this than like this. And so if we have these uh, more clement conditions happening early on, uh, we have the oxygen isotope evidence as early as 4.3 billion years, we can start to ask, was this very early Earth hospitable to life? So first off, how are we going to look for evidence of early life, especially if we don't have a rock record in which we could find fossils? Uh, well, I mentioned that we have carbon isotopic evidence from 3.8 billion years that suggests that there may have been life that early. So let's talk about more about what this means. So uh, carbon has two stable isotopes, carbon-12 and carbon-13. And we're going to present this much like we did the oxygen isotope um, results. So we have this quantity delta C13. Um, and uh, we, so carbon-12 is the uh, most common um, isotope of carbon. Um, and uh, the important point here is that biological processes tend to concentrate carbon-12, such that um, biological materials tend to, uh, be, uh, to be very rich in carbon-12 uh, relative to carbon-13. And the offset in inorganic carbon versus biogenic carbon has really held steady over much of geologic time for which we can see a fossil record. So this is a compilation put together by Bill Schaff. This is a delta C13 versus a age. Um, we see the geologic record going back as far as we have fossils to nearly 3.5 billion years ago, the earliest microfossils. And what you're seeing, we have uh, inorganic carbon that is here shown by carbonate, um, which uh, is uh, averaging around uh, zero on this delta C13 scale. Again, uh, delta C13, that's in parts per thousand or per mil. So this, uh, this is a 2.5% 2, 2 offset, or I'm going to be talking in per mil, so 25 per mil. And there's a relatively steady, um, although there are some excursions at various points in geologic time, offset of minus 25 per mil on average for these uh, um, biologic uh, uh, carbon, the, uh, shown here by kerogens. Um, and so we're seeing this very steadily throughout geologic time. So what happened at Greenland? What was found at Greenland? Um, at 3.8 billion years that tells us that we might see life there. Let's see, here we are. 
All right. So in Greenland, uh, in several localities, there are a series of marine meta sediments, uh, and they contain graphite. Uh, graphite uh, encased within other mineral grains, um, in this case, a mineral called apatite. Um, and uh, they, these were studied in a series of studies, uh, starting with uh, Moise Chadel in uh, 1996, and found to have very light isotopic signatures. So again, we have a delta C13, and we're dimensionless here on the x-axis. Um, uh, what I'm showing you here, the, sort of the range of inorganic carbon you might get out of the Earth's mantle, and uh, the range in delta C13 from various um, uh, metabolisms uh, that you might find um, today. And so the uh, very light uh, delta C13 seen in uh, many of these graphites from Greenland uh, uh, from 3.8 to 3.7 billion year old rocks was uh, taken as, uh, is interpreted as evidence that there may have been life that early. Let's look more at some of these samples. So this is a, um, a follow-up study by Kevin McKeegan from several years ago. Um, and what we're looking here is a 3D Raman image. We've got a graphite grain. It's encased within a larger apatite grain. We've got a 10 micron scale bar here. And this is encased within a larger quartz inside these meta sediments. Um, and so the idea is you have the graphite that's been entrapped here and encased uh, through geologic time, bearing this very light carbon isotopic signature. Um, and now the problem um, with uh, getting a definite age determination here, so these, uh, um, these meta sediments were dated by, their, um, by being cross-cut by igneous rocks in which you could get a definite, um, uh, definite age. So uh, we don't have, um, apatite itself uh, tends to not hold on to its uranium lead system very well. It tends to be reset by later reheating. So we couldn't get a direct age on the apatite that hosted the, uh, the graphite. However, if we have the Jack Hills zircons, uh, we have zircon, which is a great geochronometer. Um, it uh, holds uh, steady over many billions of years, um, and there are internal checks on the uranium lead system to see if it has been disturbed. And so if we can find a graphite encased within these zircons, then can we reliably extend this carbon isotopic record into the Hadean beyond where we even have a whole rock record? So there has been a uh, long and a little bit sordid history of looking at carbonaceous inclusions in the Jack Hill zircon. So a, uh, two studies came out in the mid-2000s um, that uh, were uh, quite exciting at the time, claiming to have found abundant graphite and also diamond in the zircons. Um, so this is an image from um, uh, one of the studies. This is uh, two uh, 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 diamonds and uh, graphite that are reported here. Um, so what the study, study did, they looked at zircons of all ages from the Jack Hills. I believe they looked at about a thousand of them um, and reported a relatively abundant uh, carbon or carbonaceous phases. Um, now diamond is surprising for a number of reasons um, in the zircons. So first, um, uh, UCLA, we had been looking through these uh, Hidean zircons, looked at about 1,500 of them. Um, specifically those older than four billion years, and uh, Michelle Hopkins had not found any diamond in her survey. Um, and uh, the ones that were reported in this study were largely sort of on the surface, uh, things that you might find with a scanning electron microscope, much like uh, Michelle's study. Um, and now um, uh, another interesting thing is that, uh, remember, there's only around 3 to 5 percent of the zircons in this Jack Hills population are older than 4 billion years. So there could have only been uh, 30 to 50 of the Hidean zircons in this study, uh, which is interesting that the uh, very abundant graphite and diamond was found in them. Um, now, another thing that's interesting is that diamond is a very high pressure phase. Um, we find it coming out of Earth's mantle. Uh, and so this sort of clashes with the other pieces of evidence coming from the zircons, uh, the idea that it would have been a relatively low pressure uh, from the Muscovite inclusions, the, um, the relatively low temperatures, uh, the sort of granitic um, uh, looking environment. Um, which, you know, that's okay. If this uh, is indeed what we're seeing in the zircons, we need to be able to explain it. Um, now, as it turned out, subsequent uh, TEM imaging of these uh, inclusions turned out uh, that they were contamination. So what I'm showing you here is a, an image um, uh, from this uh, excellent study that came out last year, uh, two years ago now. Um, and what we're seeing here, we're seeing a cross-section. So previously, um, so let's say we're looking at one of these inclusions. This is a plan view. Now we're looking in cross section. This has been sliced out. Uh, looking at on a TEM, we have zircon here. And we have, uh, this is a uh, potassium feldspar inclusion and a little hole that's been dug into the inclusion. And into this uh, hole have been stuffed a uh, diamond. Um, so these uh, particular samples underwent a polishing step using a uh, diamond uh, compound. Um, 
So uh, diamond polishing, um, which is often done for a lot of uh, um, zircon studies because it can give you a very nice polish. And there was also uh, bits of epoxy that ended up in there. So these zircons are mounted in epoxy uh, generally. Um, and which uh, became uh, fried in the laser beam that was used to uh, uh, do Raman spectroscopy and ended up giving the graphite signal. So unfortunately, these ended up being contamination. Um, however, this leaves the, uh, uh, the existence, indeed, and a true rate of recurrence, if they do exist, of carbonaceous phases in the Jack Hills zircons unknown. And so this leads to several questions uh, that we wanted to tackle in our study. So uh, what is the abundance of uh, carbonaceous material in the Jack Hills Hadean zircons? Is it there? Uh, is it there at a relatively high rate, as these studies suggested, or um, do we find it very rarely or not at all? Uh, second, is its uh, delta C13 consistent with biologic carbon or potentially with other processes that might form uh, a graphite inclusion in a zircon? And, uh, and uh, lastly, if we can find uh, multiple such inclusions, uh, do we see trends in delta C13 with time that could tell us something about the Hadean carbon cycle? So uh, we, have, we published this uh, just last year in PNAS, um, looking at Hadean carbonaceous materials. And uh, I'm gonna start off with the methodology we use to go through our study. So at UCLA, uh, we have several thousand uh, Hadean zircons from Jack Hill's archives. So this has been a massive effort by uh, my supervisor, Mark Harrison, and uh, several scientists at the Australian National University over the past uh, decade or so. Um, they've gone through uh, 200,000 of these zircons from Jack Hill's at, uh, at AMU, and uh, they've uh, dated them and found uh, the ones that are older than 3.8 billion years, which again, end up being about 5% of the population. So we have um, you know, a set of about 300 mounts at UCLA with uh, sort of uh, marked out uh, Hadean zircons in them. So we've systematically gone through and uh, done a visual search with transmitted light microscopy to see if we could find dark specks in the zircons that might potentially be graphite. Um, and once we find these candidate dark specks, we then uh, go to Raman spectroscopy to see if it is indeed graphite. So uh, briefly, the way Raman spectroscopy works, uh, I am not an expert in it, and I think some people here might be, um, but um, for those who are not familiar with it, uh, we are gonna shine a laser beam uh, onto a sample. So laser beam, coherent light, it's all one wavelength. And then when this light gets scattered back, it will have a, a characteristic shifts in the wavelength that are um, characteristic to different minerals. Um, and so for instance, I'm showing you the graphite Raman spectrum here for uh, probably the most diagnostic portion of it. Uh, there are these two main peaks, uh, the G and D1 bands and about 1600 and 1400 wave numbers. What's important is that uh, here I'm showing you one of our samples where we have uh, uh, in fact two graphite inclusions underneath the surface here. This is a transmitted light uh, image of a 4.1 billion year old zircon. And uh, in, in the black line here, we are showing our uh, graphite inclusion. So these are our G and D bands that you can see here. And for comparison in the red, I'm showing epoxy to show that we can see the difference between these two materials. Um, so we are not uh, graphitizing our epoxy to the extent that we could uh, confuse them. So here's a, th a third region that's very useful here. So these uh, bands tend to be characteristic of uh, CH uh, stretching in um, um, uh, hydrocarbon molecules. So we can see that in the epoxy, which still has quite a bit of hydrogen hanging around in its structure, but we're not seeing it in our graphite inclusion. So uh, we've identified some graphite in a 4.1 billion year old zircon. What are we gonna do now? Um, so uh, we, for our isotopic measurements, we measured the carbon isotopes using the ion microprobe at UCLA. We have a Kamika um, IMS-1270, which is very nicely diagrammed here in this uh, review paper uh, by Axel Schmidt. So the way secondary ion microscopy works is you have a solid sample surface um, that has been uh, polished nice and flat. You have a primary beam of ions come in. Um, in this case, it's showing a primary oxygen beam, but we used a cesium beam for this study because the carbon um, uh, uh, tends to ionize better that in that manner. Then you have secondary ions uh, come off and are drawn into the mass spectrometer for isotopic analysis. Um, and a, uh, in a previous phase of this study at ANU, I mentioned the uh, very large 200,000 grain survey they've been doing. Um, so this uh, uh, host zircon was uh, uranium lead dated to get that 4.1 billion year old age um, at ANU using a different instrument. Um, so uh, how many carbonaceous inclusions did we find? I've shown you uh, the, that one zircon. So we ended up finding uh, they are rare, but they are present. Um, in around less than 1% uh, of the zircons we have visually searched, we found this material. 
Um, we have not found any diamonds so far, but our search protocol is uh, tending to be more le uh, leaning more towards graphite. So this is sort of a blind spot. If we want to say there's no diamond, we need to sort of uh, work around to a different sort of uh, uh, methodology. But we can say that we found four carbonaceous inclusions that look like graphite based on their Raman spectroscopy. Um, now, all four of these carbonaceous inclusions, they're not found at the surface of the grain. They're found with beneath the polished surface, which uh, excludes one possible avenue for contamination. Um, and so uh, three of these are fully enclosed uh, by the zircon and also away from cracked regions. Uh, now, one of them is on a crack, and so we're going to exclude it from further uh, consideration uh, in this particular talk. Uh, because uh, a crack, if it was open uh, over geologic time, fluids could have gotten in there and contaminated and given us a different uh, um, delta C13 signature that isn't telling us about the Hadean. Um, so here's an example of a nice, uh, this is a uh, um, graphite inclusion as shown by Raman spectroscopy. We just found this one uh, this past January in a new phase of Raman um, search. This is, unfortunately, this is an undated Jack Hill zircon, so we don't know um, if this is going to tell us about the Hadean or about the Archean, but this will be a very exciting sample to look at. There's not an error, uh, a scale bar on here, but this is around 50 microns in this direction, uh, so there's a, a fair amount of material there for an ion probe to look at. Uh, and this is sort of our star sample here, this 4.1 billion year old zircon with two graphite inclusions here. So I'm showing you this transmitted light image uh, here in which it does not look like there are any cracks. But as I had mentioned before, cracks are going to be really dangerous for potentially bringing in fluids over geologic time, which could contaminate our signal. So we want to be extra sure of this. So fortunately, we have uh, collaborators at uh, um, Stanford who work on the synchrotron at Stanford regularly. Um, doing X-ray imaging at very high spatial resolution. So our co-author, Wendy Mao, um, generously allowed us to um, uh, image our sample um, during uh, some of her beam time last year. And what I'm showing you here, where this is a scanning electron microscope image. Just, uh, it's kind of fun to see how we uh, milled this uh, segment of zircon with the carbon out uh, with a uh, focused ion beam. We're looking from the top. Now we're sort of looking from the side, and you can see where the ion beam has come in and milled out this section of zircon. Now we're looking from the top again, and a needle has been welded on here. Uh, we're going to lift this section out. And now this is a transmission x-ray image taken at the synchrotron uh, by Crystal Shee, who is Wendy's uh, grad student. And uh, what we're seeing, uh, I'm pointing out the two uh, graphite inclusions here. You can see several other inclusions uh, um, also in this segment of zircon. We haven't definitively identified these yet. Um, and you can also see for reference here at the bottom, we've got the needle that was welded onto this segment of zircon. So because the, um, the needle was rotated uh, to get x-ray images from many different uh, um, uh, angles, we are able to look at this in 3D. So we've got this uh, movie going here. So we've got our two graphite inclusions here, um, but we've got, let's see. Yeah, you can see in this uh, view, it's very nice. Nice, You can see that these uh, four inclusions are not coplanar, so it's not like a crack that came in and healed. So uh, having, uh, I having identified these as uh, not being coplanar, seeing no cracks at this uh, 40 nanometer spatial resolution technique, uh, we then took this segment of our uh, zircon, we mounted it in indium rather than epoxy to cut down on the danger of carbon contamination, and we went to the ion probe for carbon isotopic analysis. And let's see, there we go. All right, so what I'm showing you here on the right, this is uh, just an SEM image of our uh, segment of zircon in its uh, indium mounting uh, medium. And on the right, I'm showing you some of our results, uh, not, in, uh, not in delta C13, but actually in the intensity of the carbon. And then this is, uh, uh, within these individual results, this is uh, time on the x-axis. Um, so what I'm showing you on the right here, these are background measurements, um, both on the uh, um, indium uh, mounting medium and also on a clean segment of the zircon itself, showing that these are several orders of magnitude below what we're seeing within our graphite inclusions. Um, and uh, in particular, you can see, uh, so we have a large segment of this uh, um, zircon that has been, is a little darker in this image. And what that is, is we took our um, ion beam, since we can, um, uh, we can move it over the surface of our zircon, um, just to clean it off to just really, really cut down on the danger of contamination uh, before we did our isotopic measurements. So you can see this uh, 10 micron uh, ion probe pit here. And at the very bottom of it, you're starting to see this whole which is our small inclusion. 
And the small inclusion is sort of fun. You can see we cut in one side of the zircon, drilled into the middle, and then drilled out the other side. So you can really see that this was fully enclosed in the, the segment of zircon. Um, and we are, we are, for reference, this is our big inclusion that is just starting to be uncovered here. And uh, so because it was, okay, so here's a second view where there's our big inclusion still here, and we have now blasted through our small inclusion. Now uh, here is a, uh, a third view where we have, uh, we've moved this uh, pre-cleaning surface much further up the zircon, and we have now blasted through our large inclusion. We're not seeing a similar sort of up and down movement with our large inclusion, probably because it had been uh, somewhat uncovered by this pre-cleaning step beforehand. So uh, we, we see that we are um, able to measure the, uh, um, our uh, graphite uh, at uh, much nicer than our background. Our background is not going to be a problem. So let's move on to the isotopic results. So what I'm showing you here, all the isotopic results here have already been um, um, corrected to our standard here. Uh, our standard, the uh, accepted value is shown here on the dotted line. And you can see that uh, they cluster about the uh, accepted value pretty well. Um, and our, indeed, our uh, uh, graphite inclusions both uh, plot uh, quite similarly, such that we're going to average them together to get our average delta C13, which is uh, minus 24 plus or minus 5 per mil. So what does this mean in context? So we have uh, um, an isolated inclusions of graphite in this 4.1 billion year old zircon, and they are minus 24 per mil. So, um, we, this is again, I'm showing you delta C13, and this time versus geologic time, or versus age, rather. Um, and you can see this uh, field for organic carbon coming in here to the extent of the microfossil record. Uh, I'm also showing for reference inorganic carbon. Uh, so at 4.1 billion years, we have a very negative carbon. It looks very much like uh, biogenic carbon has throughout the, uh, the time in which we've had a fossil record. Um, it is uh, very highly offset from the region of inorganic carbon. Um, and so what does this mean? Well, for starters, we have uh, extended the carbon isotopic record an additional 300 million years into the Hadean. Um, and this is, uh, and so this, even in this time before we had a whole rock record, this is a way forward to really start looking at the uh, carbon cycle in the Hadean. Um, now, as to is this biogenic carbon? Well, I mean, if you were to find this uh, carbon isotope uh, signal on Earth today, you would uh, almost certainly interpret it as uh, biogenic. But let's look at some other potential sources for light carbon because this is the Hadean and we don't have previous evidence uh, of uh, life there because it, you know, we don't have a rock record, it's very difficult to say. So uh, one of the other um, major avenues for getting uh, light carbon into this zircon is if it's meteoritic. And this is, uh, this is nice because we can see um, meteorites um, that are falling to Earth today. We can see there, we can look at their carbon isotopic signature. So uh, carbonaceous chondrites is what I'm going to take as an example because they can uh, get up to several weight percent uh, carbon. Um, and so although they have individual chemical components that are organic that can range very widely in uh, delta C13, uh, from very, very positive to very, very negative. Um, the bulk carbon of uh, these uh, carbonaceous chondrites tends to be about uh, minus 12. And I'm showing you here the average of uh, plus or minus two standard deviations here. Um, and so, you know, this, the lower reaches of this does overlap with the uh, field of biogenic carbon. So the question is, um, did we just get unlucky and we got the zircon from the place where the carbonaceous chondrite hit? Or is this biogenic, or does this come from any of these other uh, possible mechanisms? So other ideas that people have come up with to get light carbon, um, the idea that uh, various minerals like siderite, which is an iron carbonate, uh, their decomposition uh, has, uh, in particular at uh, Greenland, uh, there is um, a study suggesting that uh, the disproportionation of this uh, carbonate mineral could have formed graphite. And uh, indeed, if you look at these sort of uh, paired graphite and uh, um, Siderite in this location, you can see somewhat lighter, uh, that is more negative uh, delta C13 in the graphite, but the offset is not really that much. Um, it's uh, only around uh, six per mil. Um, uh, other ideas are fischer troth synthesis. This is a, um, uh, a um, broad uh, type of reactions which can uh, abiotically synthesize hydrocarbons um, uh, and has been uh, variously attributed to forming uh, methane and various other hydrocarbons uh, um, abiotically in the Earth's mantle uh, and so forth. Um, so the question is, uh, however we're going to get this carbon, we need to get it into our zircon. 
So we have a zircon. Um, it uh, looks like it came from a granite. Um, I neglected to mention the uh, crystallization temperature of it beforehand, but it's uh, 650 degrees Celsius. So it's again, one of those very low temperature looking zircons, um, very granitic looking. Um, elsewhere in the zircon, a quartz inclusion was found. Um, and so this is uh, all, you know, evidence that this, uh, further evidence that this could be from a granitic um, magma. So uh, we need to uh, take this uh, um, carbon, we need to concentrate the light carbon, put it into a uh, granite magma, and then trap it in our zircon. Well, here's uh, where the biogenic carbon mechanism comes in and perhaps has an advantage because we know that um, uh, throughout the Phanerozoic Earth, when we look at sediments, um, we can find uh, very high uh, percentages of carbon, so up to 10 weight percent or so in some sedimentary systems of uh, biogenic carbon. And indeed, when you do melt these sediments and form uh, magmas from them, you can see the chemical effects of this carbon so that it does persist um, as graphite into the melting phase. And so we see the much more reduced um, magmas coming from these sedimentary type environments versus uh, magmas that are melted from igneous rock precursors. Um, then this is owing largely to the graphite. Um, so if we were to have uh, sediments with biogenic carbon in the Hadean, and then this gets melted because we have previous uh, evidence for sediment melting to form many of these zircons, this is um, a, a mechanism by which you could get biogenic carbon into a Hadean zircon. Now, what can we say with one data point? Not much. We can talk about uh, you know this mechanism, that mechanism, um, but what we really need is a lot more data. So I mentioned uh, there are several thousand of these Hadean zircons archived at UCLA. Uh, we have, uh, 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 as of uh, January 2016, we had looked at about uh, 750 of these zircons with uh, transmitted light microscopy, which is our first screening step for seeing if they might contain graphite. Um, so let's imagine that we are able to build up an archive of 10 or tens or 100 of these inclusions. And then we're really able to get um, the carbon isotopic uh, record. Uh, we're able to get the spread um, in carbon isotope ratios that we're seeing for the Hadean. And at that point, if we're seeing something that clusters around minus 25 or lower, or if we're seeing something that looks more like this sort of broad and uh, centered higher meteorite um, distribution, then maybe we can start talking about probable mechanisms and with, uh, with more certainty. So um, to uh, briefly summarize, uh, bring around to our initial theme of this talk, which was what have the zircons been telling us about the early Earth? Uh, that is different from what we originally thought. Um, the overall theme of what the zircons have been telling us is that the early Earth was a lot more clement, a, in fact, a lot more like the modern Earth in many ways than what we had originally thought. So while well, uh, instead of the idea of a very inhospitable environment, we could have had a hydrosphere very early on. Um, and if we have a hydrosphere very early on, if we have this uh, evidence for this evolved sort of granitic-like crust, um, uh, perhaps uh, um, a bit more stable of an environment, uh, is this really inconsistent with having life at 4.1 billion years? Um, or perhaps earlier, if we are able to really go through this uh, zircon record, we have zircons as old as nearly 4.4 billion years at Jack Hills, although um, earlier than 4.2 billion years, they get much more sparse. Um, can we really push back in time the earliest carbon isotopic evidence that we were able to get, and can we this way uh, constrain when the origin of life on Earth was. So to summarize, um, we have found that there is a low abundance of carbonaceous inclusions in the Jack Hills Hidean population, but it is present and it is something that we can exploit. We can get carbon isotopic measurements from it. And uh, there is some degree of primary graphite in these Hidean zircons. Um, in fact, we've found a primary graphite in, uh, at this point, less than 1% of our visually searched Hidean zircons. But we have ongoing Raman spectroscopy to figure out uh, just how accurate that 1% number is. Um, so our sort of star data is uh, two inclusions in one 4.1 billion year old zircon. Uh, they contain isotopically light carbon. And uh, the contamination of these phases, uh, either over geologic time or in the laboratory, is exceedingly unlikely based on the imaging that we've done and our preparation steps. Um, so the simplest explanation we consider for this is that we had biogenic carbon at or before 4.1 billion years. Remember, we can't date the carbon directly. We can date the host zircon. We know it was 4.1 billion years old. So the carbon itself could be 4.1 or even earlier. Uh, it's um, impossible to say at this point in time. Um, so where do we go from here? 
Well, there is a lot of future work to be done. We have many identified Hidian zircons that are left to explore at UCLA alone. Um, and uh, in particular, so um, uh, this is a, a new image that you haven't seen yet, but I mentioned that uh, as of uh, this January, we had looked through 750 of these zircons uh, visually, but we've actually just uh, uh, started a new phase of this project in which we're doing automated visual search of these zircons. Um, we uh, just, uh, my co-author Patrick Bilka and I last week headed down to uh, Melbourne in Australia to use a, uh, an automated microscopy setup in the lab of An Andy Gletto. And so we have in the past week looked through 2300 Hidian zircons uh, very quickly, uh, very efficiently, and we're even now just trying to process all the data and figure out. So this is one of the very nice inclusions we found. You can see uh, there's no uh, visual evidence for cracks. Uh, this is a very nice dark inclusion. We haven't done Raman spectroscopy yet to see if it is graphite, but, but this is in a uh, Hadean zircon, 4.05 billion years. So this could be uh, our next target for um, isotopic analysis if it turns out to be graphitic. Um, so we have this continuing search of identified Hadean zircons. Uh, we've now begun a new uh, campaign of dating at UCLA. We are looking through a, uh, several thousand more of these uh, Jack Hill zircons. We've mounted up around 10,000 so far that we are steadily going through on the ion probe to find the Hadean ones. Um, and uh, this is going to, uh, this uh, um, in particular was, uh, um, uh, this particular study was motivated by looking for evidence of paleomagnetism. This is a study led by Ben Weiss at MIT. But we're also going to be able to then have these uh, for our search for uh, Hidean life as well. Um, and also, the Jack Hills is not the only locality on uh, the Earth where we find Hadean zircons. It's just the only one where we find them in such great amounts that they are really able to be exploited in a, uh, in a um, systematic manner. Um, we have 3 to 5 percent zircons in that rock that are older than 4 billion years. Um, but there are uh, scattered Hidean zircons that have been found in various places, uh, often in uh, sediments from the Archean time, so before 2.5 billion years ago. Um, it'd be, uh, the North China Craton has yielded several of these. Uh, recently, a single 4.1 billion year old zircon was found uh, in Brazil, uh, coming out of the, uh, uh, the Amazon Craton. And so there are a number of different places where we could potentially find more of this Hidean material. And indeed, um, this would make a nice counterpoint for, so at Jack Hills, this is one locality where we're able to look at the Hadean. But if we can um, counterbalance that with other localities around the planet, if we're seeing different geochemical stories or a more coherent geochemical story, if we're seeing graphite in, the, in these various localities as well, this can very uh, much help make the case um, that we are seeing a Hadean carbon cycle uh, that was uh, sort of a global um, implications. Um, and so what could we do if we had looked through a million Hidean zircons? Uh, so let's say we have uh, looked through a million Hidean zircons and we found a thousand graphite inclusions. At this point, uh, we can really start to talk about whether this really looks biogenic. Are we seeing a biogenic-like signature uh, distribution in the zircons? Are we seeing a more meteoritic-looking distribution or something altogether different that tells us that there were other processes we haven't thought of yet going on in the Hidean? Um, and can we then get a time series? Can we see the change in time, um, both to uh, push back further and further towards the origin of our planet and see if we can talk about the origin of life? Or, um, so there are various events proposed uh, uh, at around 3.9 billion years, uh, this uh, idea of a late heavy bombardment or a major spike in meteorite impact rates. Um, some people want it to start at uh, 4.2 or 4.1 billion years now or for there to be multiple spikes, but the idea that there could have been cataclysms um, in the inner solar system with much higher impact rates. And there's a lot of argument in the literature about what effect this would have had on life. Um, would this have sterilized the planet's surface, just so uh, much material coming in? Um, that it would have uh, wiped out any biosphere. Um, so uh, would we be seeing sort of an uh, early 4.1 billion year old biosphere, if this is indeed biogenic, that then got wiped out and an entirely new one came up that gave us the 3.8 billion year old measurements? Um, uh, or, uh, in fact, uh, do we not see a, uh, a response or a, a change in the Delta C13 during this uh, purported late heavy bombardment time period? Um, and in fact, there are some studies that suggest that uh, uh, for hyperthermophiles at least, um, these impacts might have set up uh, big uh, hydrothermal systems that might have in fact been nice uh, habitats for a select um, uh, uh, subset of microbes. Uh, so there are a lot of questions to go through with this that we really need a lot more Hidean zircons and a lot more Hidean graphite to answer. Um, and so this is a very exciting uh, field of study. We have now, we see our study as sort of the uh, proof of concept. We can find this stuff. Uh, we can um, isotopically measure it. So where do we go from here?
And uh, before I take your questions, I would just like to briefly acknowledge our uh, uh, sponsors. So the Simons Foundation has funded my postdoc uh, fellowship on which I've been doing this work over the past two years. Uh, and the National Science Foundation has been funding the Hadean Project uh, at UCLA for many years now. And thank you. Those people have questions. Uh, can can you uh, tell anything uh, distinctive with regard to the uh, meteorites and uh, the biogenic terrestrial uh, using buckyballs or uh, or uh, or perhaps some other form of uh, of graphite? Mm. So I don't know about uh, looking at other forms of graphite. I don't know the extent to which we'd be able to tell this. It would be a matter of if we can see it in the Raman spectroscopy. Um, one thing we have thought of is that if we have uh, large inclusions, like uh, one of the inclusions we've, uh, we've just identified this January is like 50 by 30 microns, if there's a lot of material there, after the carbon isotopic analysis, we might be able to look and see if there are other elements present, uh, nitrogen, sulfur, hydrogen, that might be more indicative of one origin or the other. Um, so that's something that we want to look at in future. Hello. <clears throat> Thank you for a uh, really fascinating talk. Uh, you're, as a secondary thing, you're in addition to searching for life, you're helping to characterize the Hadean with this work. and. Uh, if you were able to get a wider range of ages, uh, would you potentially be able to do a characterization of the environment during the late heavy bombardment or even pinpoint, help pinpoint the, the exact time of the late heavy bombardment uh, and see if it's consistent? Like if, if the carbon uh, isotope ratio drops lower or goes higher, or like spikes in one direction or the other, would that be... Uh, help you figure out whether a hydrosphere could have survived at least, you know, parts of the of the bombardment. Yeah, yeah. So we uh, we have Jack Hill zircons that span the um, uh, the uh, time period that is suggested for the late heavy bombardment. They are uh, pretty much continuous between um, 4.3 billion years and um, uh, about 3.8 billion years. Um, so we uh, we have zircons throughout that time period. Um, and uh, yeah, it would be really interesting. I mean, if there are uh, you know excursions in the carbon isotope record during that time, that would be really really exciting, and probably have you know these sort of uh, you know um, biosphere implications for um, what was happening during the um, late heavy bombardment. If there was indeed such an event, um, we could maybe help characterize it that way. Um, other geochemical systems in the zircon show interesting things happening uh, around the time period of like four to three point eight billion years. Um, so it looks like it might have been a period of uh, some sort of tectonic transition. Um, if you look at uh, hafnium isotopes, there's a loss of some older crust during that period. You have a new um, juvenile crust being melted from the mantle and coming in. So um, sort of it, it might be a little bit complicated to sort that out from any changes in the carbon signal, but that would definitely be uh, something to look for. Um, Thank you for the talk, it was really good. I learned a lot about zircons here, which I am completely not an expert on. Uh, one question I have, and you might have mentioned this, uh, and it's multiple questions actually. Are the zircon, is the only way to form the zircons in, the magma ch in a magma chamber? And if so, you're kind of assuming that there's already plate tectonics at about 4.2 billion years ago. Uh, and if that is the case, what is the time scale for this carbon to have formed on the surface, been subducted, and formed into zircon? Ah, that, that's a good question. Yeah, so we do, um, yeah, so we, we have uh, uh, many lines of evidence that these uh, zircons are magmatic, both from the fact that uh, sort of um, characteristic magmatic uh, oscillatory zonation is preserved in a lot of the zircons and um, the various uh, trace element ratios like the thorium to uranium ratio, which is a characteristic of magmatic zircons we, um, we see. But uh, yeah, so uh, in terms of time scales, um, I... I'm honestly, I haven't looked too much into how time scales of uh, if we had like an underthrusting environment, somewhat like a subduction zone, how that would differ from the uh, from the present to the Hadean. Um, at present, it is thought to be um, on the order of 10 million years to get material subducted, and then um, it uh, it can come out um, as you know, entrained in a magma. But um, I'm not sure. With um, there, there almost certainly would have been a much warmer early mantle. Um, due to uh, higher rates of uh, radioactive uh, decay, um, you know, higher uh, uh, contents of radioactive um, uh, elements uh, that hadn't yet decayed away. 
Uh, so it's uh, it's hard to say if if that same rate would have held. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Planet formation is an accretive process. How do you, does the science define the actual formation of the Earth at 4,500 million years back? Uh, right. So that's a good question. So um, uh, usually it will it will be um, so a lot of times when geochemists talk about the formation of the planet, they'll mean the um, uh, sort of the setting of a certain isotopic system. And uh, what I'm using uh, to talk about, so I put the formation of the planet at around 4.5 billion years, and that's based on um, lutetium hafnium isotopes that we can see in the Jack Hill zircons. Um, the, uh, so basically, so you have um, lutetium-176, which decays to hafnium-176, and as you melt uh, rocks in the Earth's mantle, they sort of like the mantle and the crust diverges over time. And we see the earliest uh, materials in the Jack Hill zircons we see that require sort of a separation event like that. It must have been pretty close to 4.5 billion years ago. And so that would be my uh, estimate for putting a bound on the, uh, you know, the formation age of the planet. Other people will try to get more specific. Um, there, uh, there are other isotopic systems that can give you different information. That's um, um, not entirely clear when exactly the planet formed, but uh, uh, that's, that's the number I would um, stand behind. Uh, I'm concerned that there may not be any chemistry approach to produce graphite with the high delta values characteristic of the carbonates. Are there any natural graphite samples that have been found with that property of high delta? Oh, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, so let's see. So there is, um, so uh, in, uh, in Greenland, um, and where some of this earlier um, um, isotopic uh, evidence in the, in the graphites have been found, um, while there are these, uh, the very negative graphites, like minus 25 and below, there are also graphites that are uh, uh, much heavier, or closer to about minus 10. So that's still not up at zero, but it is uh, much uh, up closer to the inorganic carbon field. So you can get relatively heavy graphite. I, I've got a, thank you for the talk. I've got a comment more than anything else, a, a kind of an editorial comment. T to me, the term biogenic is it's a pretty high bar. Um, you have these samples, these samples of graphite. And they have interesting properties. They, in, their isotopic ratios are interesting. But to label them as just as biogenic, I mean, you could say maybe biogenic or biogenic-like or possibly biogenic. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just a personal issue with me. It, you know, the astrobiology is a pretty undefined, I mean, it's a pretty wide open field these days. And I, I would hope that we could be a little bit careful with terms like that. That's just, again, a, just a an editorial comment. Yeah, yeah, we do. I mean, we we do point out. I mean, this is potentially biogenic carbon at 4.1 billion years. It's uh, you know, we you know, especially with one data point, we can't say for certain. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, I'm wondering the ANU group that ages gives you the ages for the zircons in your collection and gives you the ones that in the age range you want. Do they do anything in that determination of the age process that could alter? what you're seeing? Um, yeah, that's a good question. And uh, no, so what they do in the uh, de uh, determination of the ages, so they um, basically what they do, they mount up the zircons in uh, epoxy um, and then sort of polish them uh, to their, so that the midsection of the zircon is exposed. And then they, uh, so they, uh, sort of a primary oxygen beam comes in and um, there's also a, a process in which it's uh, coated with gold. So. These samples falling underneath the polished surface of the zircon. Um, I mean, the, the ion probe is a very superficial technique. It, uh, um, if, you, if you drill sort of our typical ion beams in one spot for an hour, you can get a micron or two deep. Um, whereas our, our particular um, inclusions were around five microns deep, we think, beneath our polished surface. So it's, um, it's not something that would have been affected by the uh, uranium lead dating yet. All right. Probably finish up here, but Bethann will be staying for lunch downstairs if City and Ames people want to hang around and ask more questions. And we have a little thank you, as is traditional. Ah, thanks. Ah. Please thank Bethann again.